the, the United States is now moving or sort of appears to be moving in the direction, the opposite direction, uh, because a lot of people in the United States are talking about economic decoup decoupling from China. And especially this pandemic can make a lot of people wonder, should we continue uh, uh, on this path of um, uh, supply chain integration, production chain everywhere? Should, should we consolidate the production chain uh, to our region, to America domestically, instead of uh, letting China produce everything? So that kind of uh, mentality, will it be um, feeding this kind of um, uh, uh, competition escalating this competition in, in China, between China and the United States? I think there are limits to how much decoupling can take place here. I, mm. I think for the foreseeable future, you know, 10, 20 years, 10, 20, 30 years out, there's going to be a heck of a lot of economic intercourse between China and the United States and between China and its East Asian neighbors. Yeah. And I think the situation is going to look like the situation in Europe before World War I, not during the Cold War. Before World War I, you had a great deal of security competition in, in, in Europe, which of course led to World War I. But at the same time, you had a huge amount of economic intercourse or economic interdependence. And that didn't prevent the war. So my argument is that you're still going to have a substantial amount of economic interdependence, despite all the emphasis on decoupling. But nevertheless, I don't think that ultimately it is that powerful a force for peace. Uh, I think ultimately security trumps prosperity. The United States will do what it can to slow down China's economy. You understand that that's what's going on now. The yeah. Trump administration is trying to slow down China's economic growth, its technological growth. The United States does not want Huawei to become really powerful on the world stage. It wants to slow it down. That's what's going on. But you'll still have cooperation. That's my point. I think that th this is a tragic situation. And yeah. uh, if the United States and China were to get into a shooting match, into a war, shooting at each other, this you know, would be a tragedy of the first order. Uh, so this is not something I welcome. But I'm a structuralist, and my basic view is that the structure of the international system, it's like an iron cage. It just pushes states to behave in this way. And uh, I think any time you get a country that looks like it's going to dominate its region of the world, whether it's, again, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, or China, right? That, that's going to lead to a lot of trouble. And it has nothing to do with the, the with Chinese culture or German culture. It's just that when countries get really powerful, they look to expand their influence. They look to dominate their region. And other countries will go to great lengths to prevent that. When we consider this to be a common threat, common challenge faced by the whole of mankind, I mean, should the United States and China join hands together and cooperate? Now, one could argue that uh, it's going to be climate change or mm -hmm. another pandemic, mm -hmm. another virus, mm -hmm. that'll be so threatening that the United States and China will have no choice but to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is possible. I think it's highly unlikely. And in fact, if you look at what's happening with the present pandemic, if anything, it's making a bad situation worse. So I, I just don't see uh, much cause for optimism here. During the Cold War, I guess, the United States mobilized the nation so much so that everybody perceived the Soviet Union to be a gigantic threat. But now, I guess, one of the facts that everybody recognizes is that the United States has become so, so um, divided so uh, fragmented. Every tiny fraction of, of the society has its own view, its own outlook about everything. So how is it possible that everyone, every political force, would join hands together and act against China? I think you have already seen lots of evidence that the American public is willing to go along with a tough-minded policy towards China. 
in the years since Hillary Clinton announced the pivot to Asia, that's the years since 2011, and the United States has been moving in those years to contain China, there's been no opposition in the United States. And if you look at the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they're both united on this issue. So I think there's no question that we are going to stay in East Asia and we're going to go to great lengths to contain China. I think the main question about the United States is whether it has the competence to do that. If you look at how the United States has reacted to the, uh, to the pandemic, to the virus, it's a rather depressing picture. The Trump administration, I think, has behaved quite poorly uh, in dealing with the pandemic. If you look at how the Trump administration has dealt with its East Asian allies, the Japanese, the yes. South Koreans, it's been quite inept. The, the Trump administration has done a very poor job, I believe, of putting together a balancing coalition, putting together an alliance structure yeah. against China. This is good news for the Chinese. The United States used to have a lot of soft power. The United States used to be sophisticated when it came to using diplomatic tools to win over allies and to work with allies. The Trump administration has done a terrible job on that dimension. So my argument to you, Chris, is that the United States will be there in Asia. We're not going home. All the problems inside the United States are not going to decrease our commitment to Asia. But one could argue that given all those problems in the United States, we've ended up putting a man in the White House who is not good at managing foreign policy managing the containment policy that I think is inevitable against China. 